Hi, everyone, and good morning. So last time we talked about key exchange, and we specifically talked about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. I actually got a lot of questions by email, and this is how you can uh, change my lectures. So you can just send me an email about anything that is not clear to you or you have a doubt about, and then I will explain it more in the next session. So uh, let's just review Diffie-Hellman, and then I'll get to the question that a lot of you have asked uh, by email. So the idea in Diffie-Hellman was that uh, we just choose a large prime number P, and then we said that we choose some number G such that the powers of G give us all the possible remainders modulo P. And so one thing I did not really mention there was that uh, in number theory, such a number G is called the primitive root modulo P. Of course, if you are more of an algebra person, then you would call this uh, a generator of the multiplicative group. Okay. But why is this even important? So let's just talk a little bit about what we call Fermat's little theorem. So what is Fermat's little theorem? Let me make this a bit bigger. Let me just bring it here from Wikipedia. Okay. So this is Fermat's little theorem and it's actually a very famous theorem in number theory. We mostly care about this form of the theorem. So the idea is that if I have some A that is not equal to zero modulo P, so if A is co-prime to P or if A is not a multiple of P, then A to the power of P minus one is always guaranteed to be one modulo P. What does this mean? Well, let's say I get some number I'll just choose some number, some prime number. Let's say I choose P to be five. Okay. And let's say that I also choose another number between one and P minus one. So in this case, let's say I choose a number A, for example, I choose A to be four. Now I just look at all the powers of A uh, modulo P. So I compute all the powers of A and I take the remainders when I divide by P. So a to the power of zero is just one, and that's one modulo p as well. a to the power of one is four. a to the power of two is 16, right? But 16 modulo five is just one. So if I continue like this, and again, all of my calculations are always modulo p, that's why I write 16 equals one you see that I'm already in a cycle. So I had one, then I had four, then again, I had one. So of course, if I compute a to the power of three, that's going to be four, a to the power of four is going to be one and so on. So here, what I have is a cycle of length two. And actually what I know for sure, so, Fermat's little theorem always tells me that a to the power of p minus one is one. And well, of course, a to the power of zero is also one by definition. So Fermat's little theorem tells me that a to the power of p minus one is basically equal to a to the power of zero. Of course, this is assuming that a is not itself zero. Okay, so what does this mean? I start at uh, a to the power of zero and I just keep computing the powers of a. Now, at some point, I'm going to see a repetitive number because I'm taking everything modulo p. So I can see at most uh, four different numbers here because first of all, there is no power of a that would become zero modulo p because uh, p is a prime number. And if a was not a multiple of p, then no power of A is going to be a multiple of P. So all the re possible remainders that I can have, so if A is not zero mod P, then the possible remainders that I can have for all the numbers that are of the form A to the power of I, 
are just going to be one to to p minus one, right? It's impossible that I take an a to the power of i and I get a remainder of zero when I divide by p because a itself was not zero. Okay. So I start at a to the power of zero, which is one. I keep multiplying by a and I go on. I cannot continue this forever. I will eventually see a repetitive number, which means that I have a cycle at some point. So at some point, I will have some i such that a to the power of i is going to be the same as a to the power of zero or going to be one. Now, when I get to that cycle, then I will just go through that cycle, right? So in this particular case, my i was two. So I saw that a squared is the same as a to the power of zero, which was one. Now, why is that a problem for me? Because see, if I want to encode uh, my message, let's say as the power of a here, I actually cannot distinguish between some several different messages. I cannot distinguish between, for example, two and zero, because if my message is two, then I take a to the power of two and that's one. If my message is zero, I take a to the power of zero and that's also one, right? So the whole point of looking at a primitive root like this is that I want to have all the possible messages. I want to be able to send many different messages here. So for example, in case of p equal to five, four is not a primitive root, but let's see. Let's say I have p is five, and let's say I, instead of four, I choose, let's say three. I hope three is a primitive root. So let's see what happens. So a zero is just one, a to the power of one is three, a to the power of two is nine, but nine is four, right? Because we're doing calculations modulo five. So a to the power of three is four times three, which is 12, but modulo five, this is two. And finally, a to the power of four is two times three, which is six, but modulo five, this is one. Now, here again, I have a cycle. I started at one, I saw three, four, two, and now I'm again seeing one. But this is a much larger cycle. This is a cycle of length P minus one, right? So if I have a cycle here, that generally speaking, let's say I have a cycle of length I, what does that mean? That means that I can distinguish between basically a zero, a one, a two to a i minus one. These values are distinguishable. They're different for me. And if these values are distinguishable, then it means that I can basically use these powers in my encryption system. And so if I want to send, for example, the message two, I just compute a squared, right? Now, of course, I want to have as many distinguishable messages as possible. So if I have a choice here, I would always choose this one because this one is giving me a bigger cycle, right? Now, what does Fermat's little theorem say? It says that no matter what I do, a to the power of p minus one, is always going to be equal to one, which is a to the power of zero. So this means that the length of my cycle can never be more than p minus one. That's the largest possible length, right? Because this holds for every a. It's, it holds for every a that is not zero modulo p, right? Actually, it, it gives us even more information. It tells me that no matter what the length of my cycle is, 
it has to be a divisor of p minus one, right? Because what does this say? It says that if you just multiply a by itself p minus one times, you will get back to a zero. So if I'm doing that multiplication, I'm starting at a zero and I'm just multiplying a, and I know that I have a cycle, but I'm going through this cycle several times. And by the time I get to a to the power of p minus one, I'm back at the beginning of the cycle. So the length of the cycle has to be a divisor of p minus one. So what we know here is that if I have a cycle of length i, then this i is actually going to be a divisor of p minus one. And again, this is based on Fermat's little theorem. Now, of course, let's go back to our Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Here, I'm choosing a large prime number p. And then I basically want to be able to have many different values for g to the power of a and g to the power of b. So remember, Alice chose a secret a, and then she would compute g to the power of a and send it to Bob. Bob also did the same thing. Now, when I look at this g to the power of a or g to the power of b in case of Bob, I want them to have as many possible values as I can, right? So if I choose g such that it's a, it's a situation like this, it's a primitive root, it's giving me a cycle of lengths p minus one, then g to the power of a can have p minus one different values which is great for me, right? So it would be really hard for the adversary to try all these values, let's say. But if my uh, G is not actually a primitive root, then the number of different values that G to the power of A can take is, is smaller because that's just the length of this cycle. So not so great. That's why I prefer to use a primitive root. Okay, another point is I had a small typo here and I have to fix it. So I said that Alice chooses a secret A, which is between zero to P minus one. This should actually be between zero to P minus two. Okay, or it should be between one and P minus one. Okay. Very small typo, but important. Okay, why is that? Because again, here I have a cycle of lengths p minus one. So I have p minus one distinguishable elements, right? A, a to the power of zero, a to the power of one, all the way to a to the power of p minus two. So I can choose, uh, when I'm choosing this power, I can choose between zero to p minus two. I cannot choose p minus one itself because a to the power of p minus one is the same as a to the power of zero. So I cannot distinguish those two. Okay. Now, the other question that uh, a lot of you actually asked me was, how do we actually compute these numbers? So I just told you not to worry about it. And my answer is going to, remain largely the same. Just don't worry about how we compute P and G uh, because actually computing large prime numbers is its own research field. And there are many algorithms and many ways to find large prime numbers. We don't really have this problem in practice. We have many large prime numbers that we can choose. And also when it comes to finding a primitive root, that's also generally not such an easy problem, but it's also not too hard. So in practice, you will just use a library that finds these primitive roots for you. But just to give you some basic ideas about how such a library would work, let me show you how I can compute primitive roots. And again, this is going to be a little bit disappointing because I'm not going to give you an algorithm that always works, but let's see. Okay. 
So let's say that someone has given me a large prime number P. So P is a large prime number. And let's say I want to find the primitive root modulo P. So I want to find some number G such that when I look at the powers of G, I look at G0, G1, all the way to G P minus two, I want these powers to give me all the possible remainders. Yes, uh, G is going to be co-prime to P. But being co-prime is actually not enough, it's just necessary. So if I, I just want to find the G such that uh, when I look at all the powers of G, they give me all the possible remainders. And I'm using the set notation here because my point is that I get one, two to P minus one, but I get them in some order. I don't know in what order I get them. So this set is equal to this set. Okay. So this is generally our problem. And it's again, not an easy problem. There is, uh, as far as I know, no general algorithm that would do this. But again, there are a lot of libraries that would easily give you large prime numbers and uh, generators or primitive roots G. Now, I just want to give you some intuition why this is not a very hard problem in practice. Okay, so let's say someone gives me some number J, some number G, and I want to check if G is a primitive root. So how to check if G is a primitive root? So my main problem is to find the primitive root, but I first want to answer maybe a simpler question. Let's say someone has given me G and I also have P. How do I actually check if G is a primitive root? Well, a very simple algorithm that comes to mind is just compute the powers of G, right? So just compute G0, G1, G2, so on, until you find the cycle. And by a cycle, I just mean you see the same remainder twice. and. Again, by compute, I always mean compute the remainder modulo P. So I will not actually compute these huge numbers. I will just take the remainder modulo P. Okay, let's say I do this. Now, what's the problem with this? The problem is that I'm assuming my number P is really large. And actually in the use cases that we have in cryptography, this P will be, many digits long, it will be thousands of digits long, okay? So let's say, for example, if I want to write it in binary, let's say that log of P is at least 1024 or something like that. So I'm using really large prime numbers, but that means that my P itself is something like, larger than two to the power of 1024, right? So this kind of idea will not work. I cannot just compute all the powers of G to check if there is a cycle. And actually there is a good reason why this doesn't work, right? Uh, like why do we even choose our primes P to be so large? Because if we go back here and look at our Diffie-Hellman key exchange. The idea here was that Alice is going to send G to the power of A to Bob. And Bob was also going to similarly send G to the power of B to Alice. Now we said that we have this uh, adversary Eve who's seeing all the communication here. So Eve is seeing G to the power of A. And Eve of course also knows P and G, but a was the secret. So we want to make sure that Eve cannot compute A. But if this prime number P is kind of small, 
then Eve can just do uh, a brute force, right? So she can just take G and compute all the powers of G and just go on until she gets to G to the power of A and then she would know what the value of A was, right? So it's really important that you cannot iterate over all the powers of G. And for that reason, we're going to just use a huge prime number. Our prime number is going to be so huge that we cannot do this. But then the problem is, how do I find the primitive root in the first place? Okay. Now, the way I actually check if a particular number G is a primitive root is using this idea here. This idea. So you see Fermat's little theorem tells me that A to the power of P minus one is equal to A to the power of zero which means that whenever I have a cycle, the length of my cycle is going to be a divisor of P minus one, right? So if I have this number G and I'm not going to actually compute all the powers of G, but let's say if I did, so I, let's just think about it mathematically. I would find a cycle, right? And this cycle might be very long, so it's not feasible to actually compute it. But the length of this cycle would be a divisor of P minus one, okay? So let me show the length of this cycle by, okay. I can just show it by O of G. So let's say O of G is the length of the cycle of powers of G. Or if I want to be very mathematically precise, this is the smallest I, smallest positive I, such that G to the power of I is one mod P. Okay, now what do I know? I know that this cycle length is going to be a divisor of P minus one. So now I have a really nice algorithm here, right? So let's say I just factorize P minus one. Let's say I find all the prime factors of P minus one. Okay, so let's just write it here. I know that the length of my cycle is a divisor of P minus one. And let's say that I write P minus one. Uh, I mean, I don't even need to factorize it exactly. I just need to know what its factors are, but whatever. Let's say that P minus one, uh, then factored to prime numbers is like Q1 to the power of alpha one times Q2 alpha two, so on to QR alpha R, okay? Now, what I know is that the length of my cycle is a divisor of this number, okay? So there are several cases. What are my cases? Well, it might be that the length of my cycle is exactly P minus one. In this case, I'm happy because this means that my number G was a primitive root, okay? But it might also be that the length of my cycle is a proper divisor of P minus one. So it's not P minus one itself. But if that happens, then the length of my cycle should be a divisor of P minus one divided by its first prime factor, or it should be a divisor of P minus one divided by its second prime factor or so on, or it should be a divisor of P minus one divided by its last prime factor. Okay. So if I can rule out all of these cases, then I can be sure that 
my G is actually a primitive root. So how do I rule out all these cases? Well, to rule out, for example, this case, I just compute G to the power of P minus one over Q one. And of course, again, all of my calculations are modulo P. And if this is one, sorry, I, I write it like this. If this is one modulo P, then I know that the length of the cycle is at most this much. So the length of the cycle is not P minus one. So I can say this G is not a primitive root. And then I do the same thing for all the prime factors of P minus one. And if none of these checks worked, if G to the power of none of these numbers was one modulo P, then I'm pretty sure that this case is the only case. And then I can say G is a primitive root. So that's how I can make sure that G is a primitive root. Okay. But we still have some problems. We now have a better algorithm. But first of all, I have to be very careful about how I compute these powers. And in general, this is something that we will see a lot in this course. And this is the idea of fast modular exponentiation. So let me just fast modular. OK. And basically, the idea is, how do I compute these things, g to the power of something modulo something else? So let's say that I want to compute a to the power of b modulo c. OK, or let me write mod. So someone has given me a, b, and c. I want to compute a to the power of b mod c. Now, this is probably the oldest algorithm that has ever existed. You don't actually just go ahead and multiply A by itself B times because that would take too much time, right? Instead, you would just try to find A to the power of B over two and multiply it by itself. So if I just want to write a very simple pseudocode here, let me actually change to monospace fonts. Okay, so let's say that I want to find this. So this is supposed to be A to the power of B modulo C. How do I find this? Well, I say just take A to the power of B divided by two. So let's say my answer is A to the power of B over two, okay? and then just multiply it by itself. Okay, and I'm taking everything modulo C here. So take it modulo C. Now, I, of course, I have to also be careful. This works if B is even, but if B is odd, I have to do one more step. I have to say if B is odd, then, uh, multiply it also by B one more time. And again, take it modulo C. Okay. I'm pretty sure you've seen this in your basic algorithms courses. So super easy. Now, uh, okay, yes, sorry. If, if B is odd, then I have to multiply by B again. Okay, now, why do I do it like this? Because this would, of course, decrease the number of multiplications that I have. So this would make sure that I only have to do log B multiplications. Right, because every time I go from B to B over two, and I mean, I'm just doing two multiplications here at most. So this is much faster than just calculating A to the power of B naively by just multiplying A by itself B times. Now, why do I use fast exponentiation here? Because again, when I want to compute G to the power of this 
uh, number here, this number can be huge. And I want to be able to find this really fast. So in the previous naive algorithm where I just had to compute all the powers of G, I, I would run out of time because my number P was huge. As I said, it's like more than two to the power of uh, 1024. Uh, but in this case, it doesn't matter. So even if this number is huge, the, the amount of time that I'm spending is just the log of this number. So it's something that is very much manageable and I can do this multiplication, I'm sorry, I can do this exponentiation almost instantly. Okay, so that's how uh, this algorithm is kind of faster for finding out whether a particular G is a primitive root. But now there is actually some part of it, like I, I told you a small lie. And the small lie here is that uh, I told you this algorithm is fast and we can do it easily. That's not necessarily the case because this is fast only if I can find the prime factors of P minus one. So I have to be able to take this number P minus one. And again, remember my number P was huge. So P minus one is also huge. And I have to somehow be able to factorize this huge number. And that's really not something that we know how to do. So in practice, what happens is that you use libraries and these libraries actually use uh, prime numbers of very specific formats. So they, they use a prime P such that it's easy to factorize P minus one. And then they can factorize P minus one. And because they can factorize P minus one, they can check whether a particular number uh, is a primitive root modulo P. Okay. So uh, that's basically the idea there. And one more point that I have to tell you is that you should never implement your own cryptography. And especially when it comes to things like this, whenever it comes to uh, generating these prime numbers, for example, or generating P and G, generating keys in general, you should always just rely on standard libraries. Don't try to be smart. Don't try to implement it yourself. Because another problem we have here is that when I was analyzing the security, I told you no one knows how to compute the secret given this information which were leaked, right? But actually this is only true in the general case. So if you have an implementation such that, for example, I don't know, this G has a particular format. Let's say your G is two to the power of something. It might be that someone knows an algorithm to break it when G is a power of two. So in practice, it's not like you can just choose whatever you want because a special cases of this might be solved already. So you should just use a standard library. Again, I'm going to repeat this many times in this course, never implement your own cryptography, always use uh, libraries for this, especially when it comes to key generation. Okay, but let's go back here and let's go back and talk a little bit more about this problem of computing primitive roots. So I kind of have an answer to how to check if G is a primitive root. So let's say this one is solved. It's not really solved. We figured out a way to go around it. We just said, choose a large prime number such that you know how to factorize P minus one. Okay, using that, I can now check if a particular G is a primitive root. But this doesn't actually solve my original problem. My original problem was, find a G that is a primitive root, not, not just to check. And again, if I want to just be stupid and try every G, I might not find the primitive root because I have many different possible values for G. I can take any number between one and P minus one, right? So the idea here is actually, again, very simple. The idea is choose a G randomly, just choose random values for G and check if they're primitive roots. And if it's not a primitive root, just discard it, choose another random value. And actually this works very well in practice. 
So the way we find primitive roots is choose G randomly. and check if G is a primitive root. Now, why does this work well? Basically, I have to somehow argue to you that there are many primitive roots. Okay, so let me just give you a very hand wavy argument as to why there are many primitive roots. First of all, it's a very well-known theorem that there is at least one primitive root when you're working with a prime number, okay? So I know there is at least one primitive root. I just don't know how to compute it. And let's say that I call this one primitive root that I know exists. Let's just call it uh, G again. Why not? We're always using G as the primitive root. Now, what does this mean? This means that if I look at all the powers of G, if I look at G0, G1, G2, and so on, they create a cycle. Right, I will have GP minus two, and then GP minus one is the same as G zero. In the chat, should we maybe not call line two of the algorithm X because it's, oh yeah. So I, I didn't write the base case here. So the base case here is that if B is zero, just return one. If B is one, just return A. Yeah. Okay. So this is what I'm saying. I'm saying, so uh, I know that there is one primitive root G, okay? So just consider this cycle that this primitive root creates. Now, what happens if I choose uh, another number in this cycle? And I know that all of my remainders are in this cycle because G was a primitive root, okay? So when I'm choosing a number, randomly, I'm basically choosing something in this cycle randomly. So what, what I randomly choose is g to the power of some i. Okay, so let's say g to the power of i is our random choice. Again, the way I'm choosing is, is not really like this because I don't know what g is going to be. I'm just choosing a random remainder. But I know that there, G, is, G is a primitive root, so a random remainder would just be a random G to the power of I, okay? Now, how likely is it that this G to the power of I is also a primitive root? Okay, so let's do this example again. So here I had P was five and Okay, my G or A was three. So let me just do this again. So let's say my prime P is five and my primitive root is three. So what is my cycle? I have one, then I have three, then I have four, then I have two, uh, and then I have one. This is my cycle, right? And this one was basically G0, three was G1, four was G squared, uh, and this two was G cubed. Okay, hopefully I don't have any mistakes. I'm not great with calculating anything. Okay. Now here's the thing. I'm just choosing a number randomly. I'm choosing a remainder randomly, let's say. And I want to see what is the probability that that random remainder that I choose is also a primitive root. Now, if the random remainder that I choose is my number G itself, if it's three, of course it's a primitive root, right? Now, if randomly I choose four, what happens? Four is G squared. So what do I get if I look at powers of four? 
I get G squared. Then I get G to the power of four, which is the same as G zero. Then I get G to the power of six, which is the same as G squared. So I basically get four, one, four, one, four, one, if I look at the powers of four. And basically that's like going through this cycle, but going two steps at a time, right? Because this is G squared. I'm starting at here and every time I'm multiplying by G squared. So every time I'm going two steps in this cycle. Okay. And of course, in this case, if I go two steps at a time, I will only see half of the cycle. I will not see all of the cycle. So that means that four is not a primitive root. But what happens if I take this one, if I take two, which is g to the power of three? Well, if I look at all the different powers of two, it's basically like going three steps at a time around this cycle. So I start here, I go three steps, one, two, three, I end up at four. I again go three steps, one, two, three, I end up at three. Then again, I go another three steps and I get this. One. So actually, as you see here, two is also a primitive root. Now, if I want to do this in general, I have a situation like this. I have a, a cycle of length P minus one. Now, as long as this power I that I chose is co-prime to P minus one, as long as the greatest common divisor of I, okay, let me write it here. If the greatest common divisor of I and P minus one, P minus one is the length of the cycle. I is the number of steps that I take each time. So if the greatest common divisor of I and P minus one is one, then I will see everything in my cycle. Which means that G to the power of I would be a primitive root. So what does this say? This says that I have some ordering of all of my remainders. I don't know this ordering because I don't know the primitive root G. But I know that if I choose a number randomly and if it's position I in this ordering just happens to have this property, the greatest common divisor of the position and P minus one is one, then that number is also a primitive root. But there are many numbers like this because you can imagine like P minus one has a small number of prime factors. And as long as the number I that I chose does not have, does not share any prime factors with P minus one, I'm fine. I have a primitive root. So that's why I can just choose randomly, choose a G randomly and just check if G is a primitive root. If it were not a primitive root, just discard it, choose another value randomly and just continue this. And you will soon find it. Okay. So now I have to make a confession. Uh, most of the things that I taught you right now will not be used in the rest of this course and it will definitely not be part of your exam. I just wanted to answer this question because it was a question for like 10 different people, how we actually find the P and the G here. But in practice, you would just ask a library to give you the P and G. Okay. Uh, Great, but I just, before going on, since I've taught you some number theory already, I just wanna talk about one more point here. And this point is the idea of modular multiplicative inverses. Okay. So I want you to just look at Fermat's little theorem again. Where did I put Fermat's little theorem? Okay, here it is. What does this say? Again, it says that if A is co-prime to P, which means if A is not equal to zero modulo P, then A to the power of P minus one is equal to one mod P, okay? So, uh, color. this is what Fermat says. 
if a is not zero mod p, then a to the power of p minus one is one mod p, right? Okay, but what does this mean? This means that a times a to the power of p minus two is one modulo p. Right, because this is just a to the power of p minus one. So in a sense, a to the power of p minus two is the multiplicative inverse of a. So when I'm doing my calculations modulo p, whenever I want to divide by a, instead of dividing by a, I can just multiply by a to the power of p minus two. Because this is like, yeah. Um, Intuitively, if I want to write it very intuitively, the idea is that a to the power of p minus two has the same role as one over a when we're doing our calculations module. Okay. And this, this is called a modular multiplicative inverse. So to give you a definition, I would say that b is a mod is Okay, actually I have to say that B is the modular multiplicative inverse of A modulo some number, let's say modulo C, if A times B is equal to one mod C. So basically, and instead of B, I would generally write this as A inverse. So, Again, for those of you who have passed any number theory or even group theory, this is obvious. And of course, it's also obvious that Fermat's little theorem is a special case of uh, Euler's theorem and all of the things that I said here about the length of the cycle being a divisor of P minus one, those things were also trivial to you. But for the rest of you, all I want you to know is that we have these inverses. So I not only have a way to multiply modulo P, but I also have a way to divide, okay? Great, so that's the first thing I want you to know. The other point that I want to make here is how to actually compute the modular multiplicative inverse. So how to compute A inverse modulo, let's say some number modulo n. Okay, now if this n is a prime number, finding the inverse of a number is super easy. I just showed you here that the inverse is just the number to the power of p minus two. And we know how to compute powers. We just do fast exponentiation, okay? But what's interesting is what happens if this number n here is not a prime? What if n is a composite number? Okay. So first of all, I want to say that if the greatest common divisor of a and n is not one, then a has no inverse. Can you see this? Can you see why this is the case? So in order for A to have an inverse, I should be able to find some other number B such that A times B is, uh, has a remainder of one when divided by N, much more, right? So let's say that my GCD is not one. Let's say my GCD is D, okay? Then whenever I have A times B, A times B is a multiple of D, right? Because A itself is a multiple of D. So I'm just, it doesn't matter what I'm using as B, I'm just getting multiples of D. Right, and I cannot get one. 
So if the greatest common divisor of A and N is not one, then A has no inverse. To give you a very particular example here, let's just give the simplest example. Let's say I do all of my calculations modulo four, and let's say my A is two. I cannot have a number B such that two B is equal to one modulo four, right? Because two B is always going to be a multiple of two. Two B is always either two or zero modulo four. It cannot be one. So in order to have an inverse, the very least that I need is that the greatest common divisor of A and N should be one. Okay. But I'm going to show you that this is actually enough. So it's not only just necessary, it's also sufficient. So if the GCD of A and N is exactly one, then A has an inverse modulo N. Okay. Now, why is that? And actually the nice thing here is that we can get a proof out of an algorithm. So how do you compute the GCD of two numbers? Just tell me in the chat, what, what algorithm comes to your mind? If I give you two numbers and I ask you to compute their greatest common device. Yes, the Euclidean algorithm. So, yes. So what is the Euclidean algorithm? Basically, again, let me try to write some pseudocode and let's see. I want to compute the GCD of A and B, okay? I first say, if A is itself a multiple of B, okay, then just return B, right? Because of course, if A is a multiple of B, then their greatest common divisor is going to be B. Otherwise, I would return the greatest common divisor of B and A mod B, right? This is the Euclidean algorithm. So the idea, I mean, the way that uh, Euclid actually explained this was that suppose this is like my number A and suppose this is my number B. I want to find the number that divides both A and B, right? And I want to find the largest such number. Let's say my GCD is called D. Okay, I want to find the largest number D that divides both A and B. Now, what can I do? I can say that, well, first I check. If A divides B, then great. Otherwise, I don't know this number, but I know that it's a divisor of A, and I know that it's also a divisor of B. So it has to definitely be a divisor of A minus B. So if this is A and this is B, I can just cut this part out of A, right? I can cut a part equal to B out of A. And then I can say, find the GCD of this remainder and B. And of course, the, all of these are reversible. That's why I can do that. And of course, when we're doing an algorithm, instead of just subtracting B once, I keep subtracting B as many times as I can. So what I have at the end is just the remainder of A when divided by B, okay? So that's why the Euclidean algorithm works. But actually we have this also in the chat, great point. We can do extended Euclidean algorithm, which means that Here's the thing. I wanted to compute the GCD of A and B, right? But in my algorithm, I keep changing these numbers. I say, instead of finding the GCD of A and B, find the GCD of some other numbers, A1 and B1. And then to find those, I again recursively call my algorithm and I say, uh, find the GCD of A2 and B2 and so on until at some point I get to some AK and BK and I see that one of them is uh, divisible by the other one and I just return it, okay? Now, the point here is that I can always keep track of my current numbers 
based, based on my original numbers. So I can always write any of my current numbers as the linear combination of my original numbers. Okay, so here's the thing. When I'm doing this, when I'm taking GCD of B and A modulo B, what do I know? I know that my new A, so let's say I had at some point in my algorithm, I had AI and BI, and then I'm changing my numbers and I'm going to AI plus one and BI plus one. What do I know? I know that my AI plus one is just the same as whatever my BI was, right? And I know that my BI plus one was my AI modulo my BI, which means that it was my AI minus some number, which is, well, okay, let me write it here maybe. So this was AI minus the floor of AI divided by BI times BI, right? But I can basically write all of these numbers as some summation or some linear combination of my original numbers A and B, okay? So for example, if at this point, I knew that my AI is let's say alpha one A plus alpha two B based on my original A and B. And my BI was beta one A, plus beta two B. Now, what do I know about my AI plus one? It's just BI. So this is beta one A plus beta two B, okay? And here again, I can just take the numbers from here and I can put them in. I'm too lazy to do it. So you can see that I can compute all of these numbers based on the original ones, okay? So what does this mean? It specifically means that if my GCD happens to be one, if at the end of this thing, I return one, then I have been able to write one as a linear combination of A and B. So if the GCD of A and B is one, what does this mean? This means that this BK at some point was one, but I know that I can write my BK as a linear combination of A and B. So if the GCD of A and B is one, then there are some numbers, let's call them, I don't know, let's call them C and D, such that uh, BK, which is one, was C times A plus D times B. So C times A, plus D times B is equal to one. And I have computed these numbers C and D. This is what we call the extended Euclidean algorithm, just keeping track of these coefficients, coefficients like this, okay? Now, but if I have something like this, if I know that CA plus DB is one, what does that mean? So let's do the calculation modulo B. It means that, well, DB is just zero modulo B, right? So it means that CA is one modulo B, which means that C is the inverse of A modulo B. So as long as I have two numbers A and B that are relatively prime, right, that their GCD is one. I can just run this extended Euclidean algorithm and I can find the inverse of the first number modulo the second number. So that's how I would find modular multiplicative inverses in the general sense. So how do I compute A inverse modulo N? I just compute the greatest common divisor of A and N. If the greatest common divisor is not one, I say there is no inverse. If the greatest common divisor is one, I also 
uh, have the inverse from this coefficients that I had in my extended Euclidean algorithm. Okay, so that's probably all the number theory that you need. I mean, maybe we would also need the Chinese remainder theorem soon, but let's now actually go back to cryptography and let's use these things. So in the last session, we talked about key exchange and the idea here was quite simple. We had Alice on one side, we had Bob on the other side. They had a channel to communicate, but someone else could eavesdrop on their channel. So this was not a secure channel. And we somehow wanted to make sure that Alice and Bob share some uh, secret K. So, and this K was supposed to be used as a key for their communication later on. So for example, we saw how we can use it in a one-time pack. Now, the problem with this protocol is that it's an interactive protocol. So Alice and Bob should both be online at the same time. So first Alice sends a message, then Bob responds to Alice, then uh, they each compute the secret K on their own machine, and then Alice, let's say, sends the message to Bob. Now, the problem is what happens if I don't want to have an interactive setting? What happens if one of the two parties is offline? So let's say that I'm Alice and I just want to be able to, let's say, receive encrypted emails, okay? So this is my situation. Uh, again. I have Alice here. Let's say we're talking about an email. So the idea is that I want to create some sort of an email account, but then I don't want to just be constantly online and always checking if someone is sending me a message. Again, I know for your generation, this sounds trivial. You're always online, but I'm old, so we would not be online all the time. So what happens if I'm not connected all the time and I want Bob to still be able to send me a message? And I have the exact same problem as before. Whatever I put online or whatever Bob sends to me is going to be seen by an eavesdropper Eve. In this situation, what I can do is that I can actually go back to the Diffie-Hellman Diffie idea, and I can look at all the information that was shared. So what is Alice doing? Alice is first choosing this P and G and giving it to Bob, right? Then she's also giving G to the power of A to Bob. But in order to compute G to the power of A, and remember all the computations are modulo P, so the only thing that Alice needs is P and G and A. And all of these things were created by Alice herself. So Alice had no need to receive any communication from Bob before sending these messages. So Alice can do her part of the protocol without relying on Bob at all. On the other hand, Bob actually does rely on Alice because it was Alice who gave Bob uh, the P and the G, right? And of course, Bob chooses his own secret B, but in order to compute G to the power of B, at the very least, he needs to know G, right? And of course, he also needs to know P because it's uh, done modulo P. So there is some sort of asymmetry in a sense. And actually, if you remember in the last session, I said that it doesn't matter who creates this, uh, P and G values, but it actually does now. As you see, it didn't matter for key exchange when both sides were online at the same time, but it matters in a case when one uh, party is not online. Okay, so if I'm Alice and I want to just uh, receive uh, an email, here's what I do. So in, in step one, I would just create PNG. So Alice generates P and G as before. 
And let's say that Alice also has her secret A. So she generates P and G, which are public, her own secret A, which is private. And she also computes G to the power of A, which is public. Okay, and after generating all of these things, she publishes all the public parts. So let's say she publishes P, G, and G to the power of A. Now, again, the idea is that I want to have something that resembles an email. So I don't know, as Alice, I don't know who's going to try to communicate with me. So here, what I'm just going to do is that I'm going to broadcast these values to everyone in the world. Let's say I just put them on my website. So Alice just broadcasts, not necessarily to Bob, to the entire world, and tells the entire world, here are P, G, and G to the power of A. And then she goes offline. So at this point, I can say, Alice turns her computer off. She's offline now. Now, while Alice is offline, Bob wants to send a message to Alice. Now, what can Bob do? Bob can basically do all the other steps. He can do the key exchange and also the messaging. So how would Bob do a key exchange? Well, he was supposed to first create a random number B, and then he was supposed to compute G to the power of AB, right? So let's say he does this. So Bob generates a random secret. And let's call this random secret B. Bob generates a random secret B. And after he generates this random secret B, let's say that he just computes G to the power of AB. Okay. So, but how can he compute G to the power of AB? This is, again, this is very much like Diffie-Hellman. It's literally the same. So he knows G to the power of A. Why does he know G to the power of A? Because Alice has published G to the power of A. So everyone knows G to the power of A. It's just on Alice's website. And Bob chose the secret B. So he can just raise G to the power of A to the power of B, and he will get G to the power of AB. So now Bob has this secret G to the power of AB, and I'm sorry, this should be in red because it's a secret. But of course, Alice is still offline, so Alice does not have this. But let's say that Bob also wants to send a message M. So this is the secret message that Bob wants to send to Alice, and he wants to make sure that only Alice can read it. Now, what does he do? He just does, again, all of the steps of the previous methods combined. So Bob sends a message to Alice, and here's what's included in that message. So their shared secret is supposed to be G to the power of AB. But in order for Alice to be able to compute this, Bob has to send G to the power of B to Alice, right? This is the same value that he would send in Diffie-Hellman. He would send G to the power of B. And then the idea was that Alice can just raise this to the power of A and compute G to the power of AB, which was the shared secret. So Alice is offline right now, but Bob just sends her G to the power of B so that when she comes online, she can compute G to the power of AB. And Bob doesn't wait for Alice to come online. He also takes the message M that he wanted to send and XORs it or adds it 
to G to the power of AB and sends that to Alice as well. So instead of XOR, I'm just saying add. And the reason I'm using addition is that all of our calculations are modulo P anyway. So addition is just shifting something modulo P. It's very much similar to XOR. I don't need to actually do XOR. I can just do addition. Okay. So this is the message that Bob sends to Alice. And of course, we're just assuming that everyone else can also see this. So Bob is sending G to the power of B and he's sending M uh, plus G to the power of AB. Okay. Now at this point, let's say some a bunch of time passes and Alice is back online. So what, what happens when Alice is back online? Well, she can just do the same things that we did in Diffie-Hellman. So she can compute G to the power of AB. So Alice computes G to the power of AB. How does she do that? Well, she knows G to the power of B because that was something that Bob sent her. So she just takes G to the power of B. And she also knows A because A was Alice's secret. So she just raises it to the power of A. And this gives her G to the power of AB. But if she has G to the power of AB, and if she also has the message plus G to the power of AB, so let's call this part E for the encrypted message. Then she can compute the message, right? So Alice computes the secret message M, which Bob was trying to send her. And how does she compute that? Well, it's just E minus G to the power of AB. And again, all the calculations are modulo P. So she has G to the power of AB. She has the encrypted message E, which was just the original message plus the secret. So she just subtracts the secret. She gets the original message back. So this is uh, the way that we can do all of this communication in a way that is not interactive so that Alice can basically receive messages without having to be there to uh, exchange messages with Bob while she's receiving them, okay? So this is again, very similar to Diffie-Hellman. We are basically just doing Diffie-Hellman, but we are doing it in weird steps. We are first saying that Alice publishes this information and this information is enough for Bob to basically perform all the steps of Diffie-Hellman on his side. And when he performs all the steps of Diffie-Hellman on his side, then he can have this G to the power of AB. So he can already encrypt some messages. If he has a message M, he can just add this G to the power of AB to the message M, and that's the encryption, right? But now, he can just send the encrypted message and all the things that were needed for the key exchange to Alice. It doesn't matter that Alice is offline. It will just be saved somewhere. And when Alice comes back online, she can see this part. And this part is the information that she needed for the key exchange. So she can do her part of the key exchange. And after she does her part of the key exchange, this is the encrypted message, but she already has the key for decrypting it because the key for decrypting it was the key that she got out of the key exchange. So she just decrypts it. That's the whole idea. And this is actually what we call the El Gamal crypto system or El Gamal encryption and decryption. Okay. So the previous one was named after two people. This one is named after only one person. I, I'm not sure if there's a dash, so let's just call, call it El Gamal like that. Now, this is also our first example of what we call public key cryptography. 
So this is public key. Now, what is public key cryptography? If you look at the previous uh, ways that we had for sending messages, I don't have the lecture notes for that lecture here, but if you consider, for example, the one-time path, what was the idea? The idea was that we only had a secret key. So the key was a secret that only the two sides of the communication had, and they could use it to communicate with each other, right? But then that created a lot of problems, of course, because suppose that as Alice, you might want to communicate with many different people. And again, just consider the case of uh, an email server. So I have my email server that can receive messages and I'm offline, I'm not there right now. And uh, I don't know who might want to send me messages. So I don't want to be limited to just communicating with a particular person with just Bob. I want anyone to be able to send me a message. And actually, as you see here in this system, we have this property. So as soon as Alice publishes P, G and G to the power of A, then anyone can communicate to Alice because anyone can take the role of Bob, generate this uh, uh, secrets here and do like all of these steps that we saw. And uh, the message that they will send can only be opened by Alice, can only be decrypted by Alice. So that's what I want here. So what is public key cryptography? The idea is that I'm again going to have an encryption mechanism or an encryption function that takes strings and gives me other strings. So it encrypts. And I'm also going to have a decryption function, which takes encrypted uh, strings and gives me back the original message. Okay. So, but the difference is that now I'm going to have two types of keys. I'm going to have a secret key and I'm going to call the secret key SK because it's secret key. And I'm also going to have a public key. And I'm going to call the public key PK. Now, the public key is known to everyone. The secret key is only known to the person who's supposed to receive the messages. So in this case, only Alice knows the secret key. Now, the idea is that I want to make sure that anyone can encrypt a message using the public key. But in order to decrypt, you should always need the secret key. So you see, this is uh, now kind of also asymmetric in a sense, because we were using different keys. Previously, when we were encrypting and decrypting, we were using the same key for both processes. I was using the same key to encrypt, for example, in a one-time pad, and then I was using the same key to decrypt. But now here, what I'm doing is that I'm saying there is going to be a public key, and that's what other people will use to encrypt a message that they want to send to me. And then there is going to be a secret key that only I know, and uh, that's what I'm going to use to decrypt all the messages that I have received from the other people. Okay. And of course, I want to have the same properties as before. I want to say that uh, decryption is easy. If you know the secret key, but I want the decryption to be impossible without the secret key. So someone who doesn't know the secret key should not be able to decrypt at all. That's what I call a public key cryptography system. And this is the first example that we're seeing here. So El Gamal system is an example of public key cryptography. What is my public key here? My public key is all three of these values. 
right? Because this is what I, as Alice, would announce to the world, and the whole world now knows this. So uh, this is my public key. What is my secret key? My secret key is basically anything that only Alice knows. So in this case, the secret key is just A. Right, so anyone who knows A would be able to decrypt messages. But in order to encrypt and actually send messages, you just need to know the public key, which means you need to know P, G, and G to the power of A. Okay, great. So uh, this is all for this session. Uh, I will stay for another five to 10 minutes to answer any questions that you might have, but you guys can leave now. In the next session, we will talk about another uh, uh, way of doing public key cryptography. We will see the RSA scheme. But for now, I just want to make sure that you all understand Al-Gamal. So if you have any questions, please ask in the chat.